Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Dragon's Library. So today, we are going to be talking about the new book by Rebecca Yaros, The Iron Flame, sequel to 2023's earlier book, The Fourth Wing. Now, there's a eye icon in the top right corner if you want to go watch my previous review on The Fourth Wing. I think it was a really good book. You should totally go read it. And the reason I'm saying that is because it's one of those books where it has a major twist that changes the direction of the plot at the very end, and this book picks up basically right where that book left off, so you have to know about that stuff, and if you're going to listen any further, there are going to be massive spoilers for The Fourth Wing. So, if you haven't read that, go read that, go check out my review, one of the two, then come back here so you know what the hell we're talking about. Okay? Everybody good? So, after the events of The Fourth Wing, Violet realizes that her brother Brandon is alive, Venon, these mythical creatures that suck magic from the land and drain it dry, are actually real, and their entire government has been suppressing that information for almost 300 years, in order for people to not realize the wards aren't supposed to be keeping out enemy nations with griffin riders, they're supposed to be keeping out monsters who are literally murdering the rest of the continent. Zayden, son of the previous rebel leader who had been fighting to overthrow Navarre's government in order to help the rest of the continent fight these monsters, has been secretly working with griffin riders from the enemy nations in order to funnel them weapons, which are made from the same material that Navarre uses to extend their wards and block the venom from encroaching upon them. Now aware of this fact, Violet, Zayden, and the rest of their small squadron, minus Liam, who died, returned to Vasgaya and managed to essentially force the leadership into a you can't prove that we were doing something we weren't supposed to without revealing the secret to the rest of them. And so they essentially enter a cold war with the new leadership of the college that Head gets replaced. And he starts targeting Violet in the group, trying to make them slip up so that they can be executed. Basically, upper leadership won't kill such valuable writers like Ryerson or Violet, who have very powerful signets and magic abilities and dragons, until they're absolutely sure they know this information. Meanwhile, Violet starts pushing away the rest of her friends, who get increasingly worried, as she becomes increasingly worried that if they figure out anything, they will be killed as traitors, secretly of course. And, of course, having to watch out for Dane Amos, who can read memories on a touch, and betrayed her at the end of the last book. It's basically a sort of inverse of the last book, where Viola was just trying to survive the college, and now she's actively going out of her way to do, you know, spy stuff and transport weapons with Zayden. It's actually a really interesting twist, and it makes the second year feel very different from the first year. Because... In the beginning, Violet was this, you know, underdog protagonist. She was very physically weak. And until the end of the book, she didn't have that powerful of a signet. She didn't have her signet until much later than the others, and it was very hard to control. So we get this twist where now Violet's having to do almost spy operations while the leadership of the college is trying to make her break and admit what she knows so he can just justify killing off her and Zayden. Now, I won't say much more because I don't want to get into massive spoils about where the plot goes, so let's move on to what I thought about this. And I think it's actually a good twist. Like I said, it makes the second year of her time at Vesgaia War College feel very different from the first year, which is something some of these magic school plots can get into where the you know school years feel almost interchangeable with just the plot. Also, the classes and things they're doing are very different, and I like that. It never loses the fact that people die at Vesgaia all the time and the brutality of it. Actually, they end up meeting some Griffin Rider trainees because they're on, you know, Violet's on friendlier terms with Griffin Riders now. They're all like... Oh yeah, we have to like jump onto the backs of griffins off this cliff. It's like, oh, so it's like the parapet. It's like, so so what happens, you know, how do how many of you die? It's like, nothing. We fall into the water. We're trained to die from high heights. None of us die. The people save us. They're like, your college is insane. <laughs> and it points out how like actively harmful it is to Navarre that they kill off so many of their recruits. Griffin writers regularly point this out. And I liked it. I like the book being self-aware that Navarre is like this ultra-militaristic isolationist society. In addition to that, it doesn't actually paint them as wholly evil. Like, the Navarian government has done some fucked up shit in order to keep Venon very quiet. They've had some people in their government murdering cadets who find out too much. They kill off any intrinsics. These are the ma magic users who have signets that let them read people's mind. For example, Violet's friend Dane has a classified signet because if anyone knew his signet was I can read minds by touching you or can see memories he would probably be killed. But upper leadership said, well, your thing only actually when you touch people, so we can control this and use it for interrogation. He was literally only allowed to live because A, his father is a general, and B, his power can be turned on and off. But if you can't guarantee that their power isn't reading a leadership's mind, they're literally killed on the spot the moment they're realized. This actually comes back around in a plot twist later in the book. However, despite all of this, despite the harsh methods they utilize, 
I can't really say Navarre's government is evil. Like, don't get me wrong, they're definitely assholes. But, when the wards first went up, there was apparently a call for anyone who wanted to migrate to Navarre being allowed in. Granted, they cut off that date and was like, no one in and out now. So, that's not great. And, at the same time, they did this to keep themselves safe. From their point of view, we care about maintaining our wards. As long as we keep the wards up, we are safe. And we are a nation where the venom can't get in. They're wrong. They're not as safe as they want to believe they are. But, from their perspective, this is a hard decision that keeps their country safe. And, Violet's own mother admits later on that I was kind of right about her. I, mean, I speculated on her and what she knew and how she was acting in the first book. Because I was like, does she actually care about Violet? Because she's portrayed as kind of like this asshole mother who wouldn't care if she lived or died. But, alright, minor spoiler for this, okay? We finally figure out why Violet's mother sent her to the Writer's Quadrant. Because... If you didn't know, if you didn't read the first book or listen to my review, Violet was originally supposed to join the Scribe Corporation, who were sort of like the military information gatherers. Violet was very intelligent. Like, she was being trained to be like the next head scribe, even before she got into Quadrant. And her mother knew from Violet's own character, from her father's character, that when Violet found out that the Venom were real, because the scribes are in charge of making sure the records are clean of that nonsense, and their heads are always informed of it, Violet would not take it well. She would do what she's doing now, which is trying to help people, and she would not be powerful or dangerous or untouchable as she is now, you know, bonded to a black club tail. One of the more powerful dragons, the powerful signal. They can't just instantly kill her. They have to prove they know. The moment that the archivist in charge of her thought she knew the truth and believed she would not side with them, she'd be quietly killed, which I still suspect might have happened to her father. I'm still not letting go of that theory. So, her mother was like, Violet's going to get up in arms about this. Wherever I send her, she's going to the writer's quadrant. Because at least there, she can be powerful enough or above the rules to a degree that she can't be instantly killed. Which I think was good characterization for her. I like this. And she doesn't really ask for forgiveness. She's like, you guys are alive. Your siblings and you are alive. And once she finds out Brynn's alive, that's like a massive weight for her. And it makes her come across as a lot more human than she had been in the previous books, which I liked. Violet is still one of my favorite characters. I like her relationship with Zayden, although sex scenes are a bit much. I'm not really into that, so I don't have any comment. I do like the stuff they did with Andarna, especially near the end of the book. It's a big plot twist, not going to spoil it. Finally, I also like that we got to see a lot more of the world outside of Navarre. We actually go to another country, and they have to barter for this forge that lets them forge the daggers out of that special magic material that lets them kill Vidin. And I like we get to see, like, all the different aspects. We get to meet griffin riders and people from other countries. We learn more about the world. These islands that apparently Navarre are on bad terms with now. And it just makes the world feel a lot larger, bigger than the small country. Which is, you know, Violet's worldview being expanded as she encounters the truth and goes out to actually fight against this threat. I also think the final battle and climax there, the twist with that was brutal. Also, the whole thing with Jack Barlow. I'm not going to spoil what it is, but... God damn, I did not see that coming. That was a good twist. That was a good twist. And then Zayden's gut punch at the end. See, the last book also had a gut punch at the end with Brennan being alive. And honestly, this one might be an even bigger gut punch. Not gonna say what it is, but it's... It makes you look at this whole series like this is just a tragedy, isn't it? Anyway, with all that said and done, let's go into the conclusion. I think The Iron Flame is a very good book. It does everything a sequel should do, in my opinion. It expands the world. It helps define the characters in new relations to themselves as information goes. I like that Violet, despite being, you know, trying to push her friends away, trying not to get attached because she's not like a spy or whatever, also is not doing it to the detriment of things for a lot. Like, she's getting noticed, but she's doing it because every time someone finds out the truth, the Navarian government kills them and she's trying to keep them safe. And unlike most of the times where you do this, they're so helpless and outgunned and the people in charge of them have so much authority over them that people are already being made to disappear while Violet's investigating solutions. You believe that if they find out the truth, they might genuinely end up dead. It's that kind of story. So, I like the story was actually willing to make me believe that these were reasonable responses and the characters weren't just acting because YA book have people act eccentric and over the top and stupid times to move the plot along. Most of their decisions are understandable and realistic. And I like that. However, I did prefer the first book. I liked Violet learning to grow with Tarn and Andarna. Andarna is also more present in the first book. She's asleep for like a third to a half of this book in this, you know, dragon maturing sleep, which, yes, drove a lot of conflict, but also, I like Andarna as a character. I want her to be around more. 
So, there was that. I am hopeful we're going to see more of her after the twist about her at the very end. This still gets a solid 9 out of 10 for me, though. I'm very eager to see what Rebecca Yaros does for the third book. So, uh, yeah. Moving on from there, we have the announcements. Hey guys, I've got a few other things to review before the end of the year. Roundup stuff that I'm going to do in January. I'm going to be going over Chance of Zanar and Alan Wake 2. Both of those are video games. And also just trying to go through all the stuff that ha came out this year and make sure I didn't miss anything. And once that's done, I'll be reviewing my best of the year videos. There are like three to four videos I released for the movies, TV shows, books, and video games. Just talking about what I've reviewed and what were my favorite things this year. So look forward to all of that in the next month or so, and I will see you guys next time. Finally, we have the out card. There's a video you took recommends, playlist of all the stuff I've done this year, and a big old subscribe or Go click on it, go to my channel, and subscribe. See you guys next time. Bye.